And thank you to Mayan for offering us this opportunity, and we're looking forward to learning with, um, with Lori. As we approach Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, my father's second yard site draws my focus during this time of personal evaluation and development. His daily support, his caring interactions, and his insightful teachings are still prominent in our minds. I often think of his unique style of supportive parenting, both when I was young and as a parent myself. As a grandparent, he offered love and encouragement, being fully present with all of his granddaughters, both my own children and, his, and my nieces. As a friend, he felt arevut, a sense of connectedness with everyone he met, young and old. He asked for and remembered details about your life and your family, and always reconnected through those memories, be they recent or distant. As a teacher, he engaged and sparked creativity in his students. He generously shared his own insights and more importantly, prompted others to discover great insights of their own. One of my father's greatest insights, one that came from my mother as well, was to focus your energy on what is truly important and I try and remember it every day. Every day is an opportunity to love your family, care for your friends, engage in your community, and approach the world with a hello made me kol adam attitude, an openness to learning from everyone, from our history, and from our texts. My father's openness to learning was best manifest in his role as a teacher. He was my teacher countless times, whether it was school homework, preparing for my bat mitzvah, the Pesach Seder, the Shabbos table, or adult education classes that I was fortunate to participate in. He was also a teacher for many of you, perhaps at Share, Mea, or at Maimonides. But there was also a special regard for another institution through which he taught and empowered people to learn, and that institution is our beloved Ma'ayan. For 18 years, Ma'ayan has convened an Elo lecture in memory of Rosalie Katchen. My, fa my family and all of you here who knew Rosalie still hold her memory dear. Our families have been close friends for decades. I still remember meeting Medina before first grade when our family moved back to Boston. Both Naftali and I considered the Ketchin home our second home, spending much of our childhood there. Our families shared Shabbat and Chagim meals and schmoozing, discussions of family histories, carpools, birthdays, and a lot of learning, either informally around the Shabbat table or in classes. Our families have continued that deep and warm connection despite the thousands of miles between us now instead of just two black blocks of our childhood, or of my childhood. We've continued to celebrate Smachot together and we've supported each other in our losses. Rosalie's passing 19 years ago before Rosh Hashanah and my father's passing two years ago after Yom Kippur. May we keep both Rosalie, Shoshana Rezel, Bat Avraham Yoshua, Uvela Toiba, and my father, Harav Ruven Svi Ben Harav Moshe Yeshaya, Hakohen Udvora Braina, in our hearts as we learn Torah in their memory. I'd also like to share that my brother Naftali and I have worked with two of my father's students to share his teaching online. We've started with three of his classes and plan to post new classes periodically. The website is easy to remember as long as you know that our last name has no E in it. So it's ruvencone.com, R-E-U-V-E-N-C-O-H-N.com. Um, and we're incredibly grateful to Mayan for the comprehensive recordings of his classes that were shared with us at his passing. We are so blessed to be able to continue learning from him through these recordings. And now, on to our guest speaker. We are so honored to learn with Lori Novick tonight. Thank you for coming out, Rabbi Samuels, for hosting, Mayan for organizing. This is especially significant for me to be speaking in memory of, in a sense, Rosalie and also of Cohn, because I have a connection to both families. Uh, Talia Kachin is a friend of mine, and Vuri and John were actually at my wedding. They were in college with my husband, and Naftali overlapped with my husband in Smicha. I knew him around New York. Um, so our hearts were broken when we heard about uh, Rav Kohn's passing, and if this is a little something we can do, um, it means a lot. 
I want to open with this story, something that I remember very keenly, and then I want to ask you a question to think about as we start to talk about the topic of what it means to forgive others. And the story goes like this. Perhaps you can put yourselves in my shoes. This is something I experienced about 20 years ago, but I can't forget it. It was Erev Yom Kippur, and it was actually a pretty good Elul season and Tishrei season for me, I guess you could say. I was very focused on learning Torah, I had spent a lot of time introspection, doing work, talking things out with people, seeking forgiveness, and really felt about as ready as you're going to feel. Um, Yom Kippur, an era of Yom Kippur can be an anxious time, but about as ready as you're ever going to feel to go into the big day in Bezrat Hashem, to have that sense of catharsis that comes with kapara and atonement at the end of Yom Kippur. About five minutes before I lit candles, the phone rang. And on the other end of the phone was a friend I hadn't heard from in about three months since she broke off our friendship in a very, very painful way. And she was calling me to say she was sorry. And it, it's almost painful for me now to remember how angry I was to receive the phone call. I thought that I had done all this tremendous work on introspection and growth and coming close to God and being ready to, to, to do tshuva. And I discovered for all of that progress, someone else putting themselves before me that I wasn't ready to handle or to think about was too much for me. And I think that's the first time that I really started to consider that there's another side to tshuva that in all of our focus and thoughts about how we have to seek forgiveness, there also can be the challenge of figuring out how to accept the pleas for forgiveness from someone else. So something I want you to think about as we go into tonight's learning, and maybe even I'll open it up now if someone has an idea, it's just what exactly makes it so difficult to forgive other people. So think about that. There are going to be three major areas of this topic that we're going to talk about tonight. The first is just, in general, some background about sources that talk about why it's significant to forgive. Second, who initiates? Who's in charge of the process? Who is forgiveness for? And third, we're going to look into some different stories from, in particular from the Talmud, that discuss interactions of some of our great sages around asking for forgiveness and see if we can extract from them some ideas about the hows of forgiving. So let's start. Um, you have source sheets. It's the first source on the page here. And this is a Mishnah and Avot. And the Mishnah vote divides people into four classes. So, of course, any time we want to divide people into different categories, there's, there's some level of oversimplification. But here, it's, it's still interesting to see what are the axes along which we're organizing our categorization. There are four different types of uh, temperament in people. Someone who has an easy time getting anger. Someone gets angry really, really fast, but also calms down fast. You know the type, right? Runs very hot, but it's quick, it's, it's quick to blow over. Now, this person, they say, the reward that person gets from being easy to appease is wiped out by how, by how easy it is for that person to get angry. Person type number two. the These are your slow burners. It takes them a long, long, long time to get to it good and angry. But once they're good and angry, it is very, very difficult for themselves to extract themselves from that situation, from that feeling, and to get over it. I'm sure we all know people like this, too. Yetzayev said, Dobzchawo, similar. Here, too, there's something that's great about this person, right? This is a person who has the reward for the fact that they're slow to get angry, and yet they lose that reward because... They can't get over things. They can't forgive. And then there's the ideal type. Unfortunately, I think the ideal type is a little rarer. Yeah, that might be what we aspire to. It takes you a long time to get angry, but also you're quick to forgive. 
And the last, noach lichos v'kashel So too many people like this, perhaps, right? People who get angry fast and don't get over it fast. Um, what's interesting about these axes, of course, is that we're saying that one of the identifying characteristics of a person, a defining element of who someone is, is not just how quick they are to react negatively to someone else or to be angry, but also, as significant, how long it takes them to become appeased. Part of who you are, the type of person you are, has to do with your ability to give forgiveness. Um, Hashem apparently appreciates this also. In source number two from Sachim, Shlosha HaKadosh Ohavan. There are three types of people that God loves. Now, of course, we believe that God loves everybody and he loves for a lot of different reasons, but in this particular Gemara, they're focusing on three traits. Mishen O'Koes, again, this idea of not getting overly angry. Mishen O'Mishtaker, people who avoid getting drunk. That's new to the scene. Umisha Enoma Mid Al Midotav. Someone who doesn't stand on, literally it means like stand on their measure, it means really hold fast to what they deserve. Someone who isn't, who isn't always saying, no, it has to be exactly, it has to meet the standard of what's coming to me. Someone who's willing to say, even if that wasn't what's coming to me, um, I can let it go. Okay? Again, we see this pairing of anger and of a version of appeasement. And here we see that it's not just something that defines a person, but that having that ability to let something go is something that merits God's love, okay? Which is a pretty, it's a pretty good incentive, but if that's not enough, source number three, we see a further incentive for being able to forgive. Amarava. Kolama vir al midotav, a similar idea. Whoever is willing to let go, to be easily appeased, to forgo, to forgo uh, insults from others. Ma'avirin lo al kol pshav. That person, the heavenly court, as it were, passes over their iniquities. Why? Well, it's a kind of funny reading of a verse. Describing God, we say that God can lift up or take away iniquities and that he can also overlook, over, al pesha, on someone's wrongdoing. But we can read that in a slightly different way. Whose sins are they that God will lift up or remove from them? The person who themselves is over al pesha, forgiving. In other words, if it wasn't enough that this is one of the definitive characteristics of the human being, and that forgiving other people is something that God loves, okay, what we learn from the Gemara here in Rosh Hashanah, additionally, is that it's when we forgive that God, in fact, has an easier time forgiving us. A sort of mida keneged mida. I think you could also possibly suggest a more psychological reading of this. People who are forgiving are able perhaps to perceive God's forgiveness in a greater way. Some of us who have trouble forgiving others might also struggle in particular with forgiving ourselves or with imagining that God can truly be forgiving. And these things go hand in hand. So it's significant. But who's it for? And what are the limits? Well, interestingly enough, there's, there's, there's a Torah-level prohibition against bearing a grudge and seeking vengeance, right? Now, it's not the same thing as forgiving. Someone could not forgive somebody else, and that wouldn't mean necessarily that they were seeking vengeance, right? Seeking vengeance is another level of response beyond, let's say, not forgiving. But loti kom and loti tor, not to seek vengeance or bear a grudge, is absolutely prohibited. And yet, there's a discussion in the Gemara that says that there might be some cases where that is appropriate. And again, that goes beyond, it would sound, not forgiving. Now, we've just read about how significant and how important it is for us to be able to forgive. The question is what that means. So come look with me. Amar Rabbi Yochanan Mishim of Shimon ben Yotzadeh. I think it's a shocking statement. 
Okay, he says, any Tamid Chacham who does not, and it's the deliberate play on the biblical verse, who does not, in fact, seek vengeance or bear a grudge in the comparison, like a snake, is not really a Talmud Chacham. Now, if there's anyone we would generally expect a higher standard of behavior from, we would expect the higher standard of behavior from a Talmud Chacham. I would have thought that if there were any exceptions for vengeance or grudge bearing, that the Talmud Chacham would not be it. But here we're told that it is a Talmud Chacham. The Gemara asks a natural question. The Haktiv, but it's written, Loti Tor. What are you talking about? This is an Isur Doraita. It's a Torah level prohibition. Now the Gemara offers the first answer, but it's not the end of discussion. Answer number one. Hahu b'mamon hu dichtiv. Perhaps the prohibition against seeking vengeance is specifically with regard to monetary matters. But if someone causes you personal anguish, maybe in that case there's more allowance for being unforgiving. Now, we're not going to end here, and in fact, this is not the ending point of the Gemara, but it's still significant. Why? Because it's our first inkling, the sources we've seen tonight, that there's forgiveness and there's forgiveness. There are sins and there are sins. There might be someone, for example, who has an easy time being appeased in any number of situations, but there's one area, there's just one thing, that if the person is hit in that specific spot, they cannot forgive. Probably the logic behind this Gemara, and this is roughly how the Rambam explains it, has to do with the idea that a Talmid Chacham is not just an individual, a person. A Talmid Chacham is also someone who's representing the Torah. And Rambam explains that this is in particular in a case where that person has been, the Talmid Chacham has been insulted in public. Because an insult to a Talmid Chacham in public is particular in areas pertaining to Torah, could be seen as an insult to Torah. And in that case, perhaps we could say that when it's personal, that there is some sort of an obligation to address or to respond, even in a negative, vengeful way, if someone's attacking not oneself in a personal way per se, but as a representative of the world of Torah. But like I said, the Gemara did not end there. Vitsara de Gufalo, wait a minute. We really don't apply the prohibition of vengeance also to when someone causes another person anguish? You're really going to restrict its application? No, no, no. Tanya, we learn. People who get insulted and don't insult back, who hear people saying things that might shame them and they don't respond, they act out of love, they can take difficulties and challenges, those are people that God treats in a glorious way. We say that they are ohavav. They are lovers of God, or you can read it as they're the ones that God loves. And they are ketzet Hashemesh b'gvurato. Their glory is so great that they can be described as being similar to the sun when it emerges at full strength. In other words, if we take this teaching seriously, it's very hard to start saying that vengeance could have an application even perhaps in the case of a Talmud Chacham. How can we understand this original statement in this Gemara that suggests that Talmud Chacham does have to seek vengeance even when he's representing the Torah? Can we limit it further? And in fact, the Gemara does. Limitation number two. He's not actually supposed to express it in an active way. It's something that he's supposed to be aware of and keep to heart. Okay. And then... We learned something else about forgiveness and forgiveness. The Hamarava, question again. What we just learned. We have many, many different sources that seem to point to the significance of forgiveness and not vengeance. And the response? This idea that what's going to achieve forgiveness for you is forgiving others and that we should try to globally forgive might in fact be restricted to a situation in which the person we're dealing with, the person who has hurt us or done wrong, has initiated the process of forgiveness. These are two very different pictures 
about how forgiveness works. Now, they can coexist, but I want us to just think about the difference a little bit, right? One picture is, globally, I need to seek out ways to forgive, right? Or maybe even we could say I should be proactively forgiving. In source number five, I have Marzutra, who every night before he went to bed, he would say, I forgive everyone who has wronged me. Um, that is a tremendous quality for an individual. We could also wonder if maybe there's something lacking there. It's a funny thing. There are two sides to this coin, right? On the one hand, proactive global forgiveness is an extraordinary act of someone saying, I am not so high up relative to other people. I'm willing to accept what they've done, and I'm willing to say that I can be forgiving of them and to let it go and move on. There's a greatness to that position. On the other hand, what's lacking? Some element of the work involved of actually confronting the specifics of who has wronged you or the specifics of what it might mean for them to seek forgiveness and how to relate to that. That's not there. And what's interesting is this tension between saying that forgiveness should be something that's really initiated by the person who has done wrong and between saying forgiveness is something that we almost preemptively should grant everyone in, we encounter, it's something that carries, tr carries through a fair number of our mikorot. For example, I want to draw your attention to Tosefta and Babakama, which takes the idea of preemptive forgiveness to an extreme. Babakama talks about the laws of damages. So one of the cases is when one person causes damage to another person, what's called a chovel b'chavero. And there are different types of payments that one has to pay in restitution. But here, the Tosefta and Bavakama adds another layer to the discussion. One who has done damage to his fellow, even if the damager did not seek or request it from the one who was harmed, the person who was harmed, tzarich. Tzarich is very strong language. Tzarich means needs, has to, and it's not just what we might have thought based on our discussion up till now. He has to forgive. What is it that he has to do? Has to pray for him? Someone, just think about this for a minute. It, it almost boggles the imagination. No, we, we have someone has done real damage to another person. And the Tosefta is saying that even if that other person hasn't asked for it, it's not just that one has to forgive, one has to pray for the person who has done harm. It's taking this idea to an entire other level. Now the basis for saying this is actually very interesting. It's the story about Avimelech and Avram Avinu. Avimelech, you'll remember, takes Sarah. He thinks that Sarah can be his wife. And uh, Hashem uh, in, afflicts Avimelech with a malady so that that is not able to actually happen. And as the story resolves, tells Avimelech to return Sarah so that Avraham can daven for him. And in fact, Vayipalel Avraham el Elohim, Avraham does daven to God. And it's at that point that Hashem cures Avimelech. In other words, we have this amazing story. You never think about it. It's right there in Breshi. We read it every year. We have this story. It's 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 the the that we see in different guises of 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 the of of Sarah and of Rivka being taken. And this happened more than once in our history, being taken by another, and the Av has to has to react, and we have to have a some sort of a settling of the claim. Someone has to understand what, is, what has happened and why this cannot be done. But here, what sometimes gets overlooked is that Avraham does not just resolve the issue with Avimelech. He actively prays for Avimelech. He has been wronged, but he prays for the person who wronged him. And what's more interesting is that the result of that, 
the result of praying for the person who wronged him is for whom? Who gets helped by this? Who, who, the wrongdoer got, Avimelech, the aggressor, right? He's the one who seems to be helped by the prayer. It seems like we're asking for a tremendous act of altruism on behalf of the person who is hurt. And yet, you have a question? Yeah, Please. But Avimelech, once he realizes that Sarah wasn't Abraham's sister, but indeed was his wife, says to Abraham that he didn't realize so he did attempt to ask for forgiveness. Was the praying before or after he asked for that forgiveness? Okay, so it's, it's after he gives her back. So it's after. But um, what's, what's interesting is, as you say, Avimelech isn't a perfect case here because there's a certain level of damage done, but only to a point. And it's not 100% deliberate. It might be for that reason that the Tosefta brings another example. Um, but the other example complicates matters because it has a different effect. The other example is from the story of Eov, where Eov's friends are told to bring sacrifices um, as part of an act of restitution. You know, they, they, in a sense, they fail Eov. Um, and the result is that Eov then prays for them. After Eov prays for them, V'ashem shavet shvut Eov. God, you know at the end of the story when God gives him more children and everything back and somehow everything is supposed to be restored as though nothing happened? That follows Eov davening for others. Uh, the Rav actually has a beautiful vort about how perhaps this is essential to what Eov's growth has to be over the course of his Sefer, but what's Interesting here is, in this case, who benefits from the praying for the other? Eov benefits from the praying for others. It complicates the matter a little bit. We have here something that sounds like preemptive tshuva, right? Whether or not the person asks, the person who is wronged in some way is supposed to daven for them. But there is a question about who that davening is really for. When we perform an act of preemptive forgiveness, are we doing it from a position of caring for the person that we are forgiving? In a sense of, we don't want someone to be punished on our account. We are willing to let things go to forgive the other person for their sake. Or are we saying that when we preemptively forgive another person, we're doing it in part for ourselves. I pray for the other person who wronged me. I'm hoping that that super act of rachamim will perhaps lead God to show me a super act of rachamim. Again, we can take this on a psychological level to a psychological point as well, right? When I am forgiving another person, is that is it really for them, or is it really so that things can be whole for me? Because I think we know that when we bear grudges, or that when we don't forgive, it can leave us in a very uncomfortable place. Yeah? So you said that Abby Malik was the one who was healed from this, but it's the women at the court who are bearing children who then start to bear children, and then right afterwards is when Sarah is able to bear a child. Okay. So I'm, I'm, how is Abby Malik the one being? Okay, so you're right. In the context of the Tosefta, Avimelech is directly healed. But in fact, the Avraham story is brought again um, in, in Bava Kama. And there, the emphasis seems to be on the idea that he davened for Avimelech, and therefore he received what he was davening for. Avimelech gets his child, but it really ultimately is working also to Avraham's benefit. What's interesting is you can read perhaps the same story with different emphasis. And that might not be wrong in terms of the dynamic that we've been setting up here, right? It may well be the case that when we forgive, both things are supposed to be going on. That there's some element that's supposed to be about the person who seeks forgiveness and hoping that they should not suffer for their wrong to us. That that's not really what we want for them. But there's also the element of wanting ourselves 
not necessarily specifically for the reward, but also perhaps for the reward, but wanting for ourselves to be in a position where we're not walking around not being able to forgive someone. Both of those things could be true, as in these different interpretations of the Avram and Avimelech story. And in fact, the Gemara in Bava, the Mishnah in Bava Kama really presents this in a different way. You remember the Tosefta says this shocking thing, you've got to pray for them, whether they asked it or not. The Mishnah in Bava Kama says something very different. Back in the world of damages, right? Someone does a wrong to another person, and that means that they have to pay up. Mishnah, source number seven. Even though the person who did wrong pays up, the claim is not settled. The word mechila is a very specific word for forgiveness. It's like forgiveness of a claim, forgiveness of a loan, waiving a right. It is not settled. Here it is, explicitly. Almost the opposite of what we saw before, right? Someone can pay. We might have the misimpression that once we've got a whole setup of these are the payments that you make if you do wrong to another person and you pay for their shame and you pay for their anguish and you pay for their healing, etc. How much they missed for? We might have thought that that's really it. You pay and you're done, like a parking ticket, right? I don't think that after we pay for a parking ticket, we walk around feeling that there's anything left to settle up, okay? But the, and perhaps even before we pay for the parking ticket, we don't think that there was anything that needed to be settled up. But in the Mishnah here in Bhavatama, what we're saying is it's not enough. Even when we have a very clear system and guidelines of what it means to settle up, the person who has done wrong also has to say, forgive me. In the bait din, in the physical world, there's not an additional claim to actively pursue. He's done, the case is closed. In the bait din shall mala, until he asks for forgiveness, on high, in God's bait din, it's not over. But here we see, again, that the initiative is coming from this perspective, from the person who did something wrong. So we really can go in both directions. The Mishnah in Bhavakama is not the only place where we see, of course, this dynamic of the importance of asking someone for forgiveness in terms of our halachic obligations to another. Probably the most prominent source in this regard is source number eight, from the Mishnah and Yoma, talking about Yom Kippur. Now, we learn that there are certain types of sin for which we don't receive kapara, we don't receive atonement, until Yom Kippur rolls around. In other words, we can do this, uh, different acts of tshuva in advance, but Yom Kippur itself has a certain power to grant atonement. That's what Yom Kippur means. Now, by the way, just parenthetically, we talked about mechila as sort of a settling of accounts, right? Kapara is also a unique term in terms of forgiveness. Atonement doesn't just mean that you accept someone's apology, as it were. Atonement means really, like the word kapara, like kapara, covering the arm, it means really, it's covered over, it's done, we've pressed the reset button, and we're starting afresh. Okay, so on Yom Kippur, we are seeking kapara. We don't just want forgiveness for what we've done. We want something beyond forgiveness. We want the reset button, and we want it from God. Because when we sin against another person, it's not just an affront to that person. It's not just, in some sense, what we've been talking about, something that redefines who we are in our dynamics with other people. It's also an affront, of course, to our relationship with God. And here's where things get interesting. Source number eight, line two. At Zodarash Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah. This is what Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah taught. And he's taking this from the verse that we say many times over the course of Yom Kippur davening. Because on this day, he will atone for you to purify you, who's he? God. Mikochatotechem from all of your sins, now here's an interesting question is how to read this. From all of your sins, 
Now, a classic way to read this is to say, from all of your sins, lifnei Hashem titaru, before God, you will be purified. Right? God's been the subject of this sentence. And our sins are ours, but God, standing before confronting our sins, is able to purify us. And that, that's, in fact, how Rabbi Akiva, later in this Mishnah, reads things. He says it's almost like God is our mikveh, purifying us from sin. However, Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria reads this verse differently. He says, it's mikoch hatotechem lifnei Hashem, comma, titaru. On Yom Kippur, when we're seeking atonement, God is purifying us, says Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria, from all of our sins, lifnei Hashem, from all of our sins that are the sins before God. In other words, the power of the day to atone is limited to fully account for atonement for sins that are not just before God. What are the sins that are not only before God? Sins between man and man. And that's what he continues and he says. He says he learns from this, specifically sins between me and man and God. Yom Kippur can grant atonement for. Those are chatotechem lifnei Hashem, your sins before God. But your sins with other people, those shebeino levein chavero, en yom kippurim mechaper ad shiratze et chavero. God does not grant atonement until we have sought forgiveness. And it's not just sought forgiveness. It sounds like yiratze, that forgiveness has been granted. Forgiveness is there. Even outside of the context of specific payments that need to be made and what that, what that means, when we come to Yom Kippur, why is it that we might get that pre-Yom Kippur phone call? Because people feel the pressure before Yom Kippur that this is their moment. It's true any time of year that if you've done something wrong to someone else, the claim is not settled on high until you've made the effort to appease them. But come Yom Kippur, when the day itself has the power to grant atonement, you are not going to see that atonement if you have not made the effort. The flip side of that is that someone who has been wronged on some level stands as a gatekeeper before Yom Kippur. And we think on Yom Kippur so much of how we stand in God's hands like clay and, and, and the maker and how vulnerable we are. And here, on some level, we're saying, we, the people in a position to forgive, share some of that power. God is saying, I'm not ready to make things square between me and another, between me and a person, I'm sorry, between me and a person who has sinned until that person has sought reconciliation from the person they have wronged. That's not to be taken for granted. Um, there's a mashal that we can understand this like, um, that on some level it's, uh, it's brought in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, if we look in uh, source number 11 in the middle. The third line. Lamaha devar domeh. What's this like? A person lent someone else money. Okay, a quantity of money. The kavalas man melech, and they set the time of when it should be returned, and all of this happens in front of the king. Okay? This is this is done in a very official way in the presence of the king. Vinishbalo melech, and swore to pay it back, and they say, by the life of the king, I will pay it back. He gives man the parao. Time comes and defaults on the loan. Balafayesa The person in that situation, the first thing that person thinks is, uh oh, who have I got to make it right with? The king. What am I going to do? I promised to pay this loan back in front of the king. And I made an oath by the life of the king. I have to settle things up with the king. And if the king says it's all right, then it seems like it would be all right because it involved him. And in this case, the answer is, what does the king say? No, 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 no. 
I can forgive you your insult, but it's, it's not going to work. You've got to go and you've got to do that interpersonal job. So the role of forgiving the other person, it's not just about defining, the significance is not just about defining who we are, and it's not just about ourselves seeking God, being forgiving of us, it's also understanding that on some level that person is going to be in a state of rupture and not going to receive full atonement if forgiveness cannot be achieved. And we're still back to the question of, okay, well, if they ask or not, what kind of a difference does that make? It seems like, from the sources we saw in the Mishnah, certainly, the person really has to initiate. Do we have to forgive? That's a little harder. The Talmud Yerushalmi tells something interesting. It says that, you know, if, if, if you ask forgiveness and, and the person says it's okay, that's great. And if you don't, and you, I'm sure you're familiar with this tradition, if you don't, you have to bring a lot of people with you to ask forgiveness again. And it seems always like a kind of peculiar Allah. Why is that the next step? It might be that that social component is also something important to teach the person who's having trouble forgiving. In other words, one of the things that can drive us to understand and to feel that we need to forgive is cognizance of what that means for the other person standing before God. One of the things that might drive us is the idea that perhaps our prayers will be answered too if we can even get ourselves to the point where we can pray for the person who hurt us. But another thing that can make a difference is, um, is to understand that our relationship with that person is also in a larger social framework. And when someone wrongs the other and they bring, as it were, almost society with them, it's as though they're saying, I'm calling everyone to witness to see how significant it is to me on every level that you be able to forgive me. It's the person really saying, I can't go on playing my high role in society if things between us have not been righted. Okay. Part three, we've talked a little bit about the significance of forgiving. We've talked a little bit about who's initiating and who or what it's for, right? It can be for me as the forgiver. It can be for the person seeking forgiveness. It can be for God in a certain sense, and it can be for, on some level, the entire Jewish people and enabling us all to function in a way that is honest and right with each other. But the question remains still, so we really should forgive, but how do we do it? Someone can call you, right? You get that phone call, and you struggle to forgive, and there are a lot of different ways that you can say you forgive, and sometimes you can even say that you forgive without really forgiving, right? Or you can say that you forgive and mean to forgive, and yet decide that you don't want the other person to really understand that you've fully forgiven, if you follow. In other words, sometimes we might forgive in our hearts, but we don't necessarily want that to go to the extent that the other person doesn't have to work a little harder for it. There are all different kinds of games that we might play when someone is actually standing in front of us and seeking forgiveness. Now, there's some very interesting stories about our sages and how they kind of navigate this type of situation. I want to start with a story about Rabbi Yirmiya. This is on page four, near the bottom of the page. Rabbi Yirmiya Havale Milta the Rabbi Ava Behade. First of all, I like the way that this is phrased. Rabbi Yirmiya, well, he was having, there was an issue that, there was an issue, a matter that Rabbi Ava had with him. So it's just, there's just something very frank and honest about this. You have two great sages, and in fact, you can be two great sages and you can have a disagreement, not just a disagreement. I mean, we disagree about matters of Allah, Allah, Shem, Shemaim all the time, right? But you can have two great sages, and you can have real conflict, and you can have insult, and you can have hurt, and you can have a need for forgiveness. What happens? Azo, Rabbi Yirmiya goes, Etiv Adasha de Rabbi Abba. He goes and he sits at the threshold of the home of Rabbi Abba. Let's stop for a second and think about this. Now, Rabbi Yirmiya needs forgiveness, right? 
What would be the most straightforward way for him to ask forgiveness? What should he do? I might imagine that he would knock on the door. I might imagine that he would come in, that he'd have a conversation. There's something profoundly human about him standing in this liminal space, which is sort of the outside world where he belongs in sort of the private space of Rabbi Abba, and waiting there for the moment, the opportunity, the cue about how to seek forgiveness. Because there's something true about that to the moment of seeking forgiveness, right? We're sort of entering into another person's intimate world at that moment if we really want them to hear us and return to what was painful for them. Well, he's standing there at the threshold. And at that moment, it's the same moment when the maidservant of Rabbi Abba is cleaning house. She's doing, you know, like the Israelis do a sponja, tons of water all over the floor, dirty water to flow out. So at that point, she's throwing the dirty water out of their home. Mata zarzife de Maya Resha. And guess what winds up dripping on the head of Rabbi Yermia, who's standing at the threshold? The dirty water. So how should Rabbi Yermia react to this? Well, I mean, there are a lot of ways he could react, but he's, he, he reacts to it in a very symbolic way. And he says, Amar asauni ke ashpa. This fascinates me from the perspective of the person seeking forgiveness. He's made me like garbage. Now, of course, he didn't make him like garbage, right? Rabbi Abba did not actually take dirty water and put it in Rabbi Yirmiya. It just so happens. And I don't think Rabbi Yirmiya thought that was what was going on. And yet there's this sense when you have to ask forgiveness from another person that on some level, it, it, it's, it, it's lowering, it's humbling, right? You stand there and you feel perhaps for a moment something like garbage. Kara nafshe, but he's not dispirited by this. What's extraordinary is that this encourages him. He says, the, there's a pasuk that applies to me in this moment. Okay, he's reading the moments of his life symbolically, and he says there's a pasuk that's relevant here, and it's also a very nice play on words. Remember his name is? Yermia. Me'ashpot yarim. Yermia, yarim evyon. From the garbage will rise up the impoverished or the, 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 the forsaken one. What's he saying? He's, he's, he's in his moment of seeking forgiveness. And on some level, he's, he's still waiting for Abba. There still hasn't been an encounter. But on some level, he's taken the fact that the dirty water is upon him as, a, as almost a form of absolution. Okay, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can move beyond the threshold. Now, what's interesting to us in our context is Rav Abba's response. Shama Rabbi Abba. Rabbi Abba hears. Now, I don't know if he heard the water, though I imagine he figures it out, but he hears Rav Yirmiya say, Asauni Kashpa. He's made me like garbage. And his response is, Amar Hashtat Srichna Lamepakadatach. Now I have to discharge or, or get appeasement from you. In other words, now I feel like I have to ask you for forgiveness because something has happened here that's beyond anything I ever intended, that it wasn't what I wanted. But in the context of coming to my home to seek my forgiveness, you have been made to feel like you are like Ashpa. Even if you are encouraged by that in a sense, still it's belittling to you. Dichtiv, and I, he, quotes a, he quotes a verse from, from Mishle that tells us that we have to humble ourselves and urge our fellow to, to seek forgiveness. What's amazing about this exchange for us in thinking about how to forgive is how quickly the tables turn. We go into the story, and it's very clear to us that Rabbi Yirmi is the one who did something wrong, and Rabbi Abba is the one who's in a position to grant forgiveness. But Rabbi Abba makes clear, and in its own way, it's a very powerful act of forgiveness in and of itself, is that these roles can change in a flash. For better or worse, one moment I hurt you, and the next moment, you hurt me. And sometimes it's witting, and sometimes it's unwitting, and sometimes it's more severe, and sometimes it's less severe. But if we're thinking about lessons for us of how to help us achieve the ability to give forgiveness, one idea that I think emerges from this particular story is that we could be, we have been, 
and perhaps we will be, on the other side. And the more we're able to understand that in a flash, we can let go of our victimhood or our sense or our status of being the wronged one, and we're able to see that those positions are really very fluid, we're in a much better place to be able to release and to be able to recognize that the person standing before us is a human being in need. That's story number one. Story number two. Rabbi Zera. Rabbi Zera, ki havale milta bahade inish. Rabbi Zera, when someone had a complaint against him, by the way, another great moment. Sounds like this happened a lot. Have a khalif batani le kame, you mamsi like. He would always pass by in front of the person and make himself available to them. Sometimes, when someone has wronged us, the last thing in the world that we want is to be anywhere near them. Sometimes that's because we're so angry and we don't trust ourselves in terms of how we're going to react. Sometimes it might be because we're so hurt and we're not ready to confront the person who has hurt us. But here at this moment, what Rabbi Zera is saying to us is, if we can snap out of that for a moment, we need to make reconciliation possible. That's the person. The other person is perhaps the one who's going to be asaola ashpa, who's going to have to humble themselves to seek forgiveness. But we can make ourselves available to them. Have you ever had this situation where you've really sought forgiveness from someone and you haven't been able to get a hold of them? Has that ever happened to you? That you, 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 wanted, you wanted to reconcile with somebody and they kind of avoided you or they just, it, it didn't seem like they were open to that? It could be really avoiding. It could be the way you talk to someone in the conversation. Are you really listening? Are you really looking at them? Are you really thinking about what they have to say? The idea here is Rabbi Zera practiced radical openness to the other person who had wronged him. He made himself genuinely available to work things out. Story number three, and this is a doozy. Rav. Rav havale milta vahadi hautabcha. Rav had some kind of a dispute going on with the butcher. Okay, it seems like the butcher did something wrong to Rav. Lo atalakame. Now, he, apparently he expected the butcher to come and seek forgiveness, and the butcher did not come before him. Okay, so Rav has been wronged by butcher. Butcher is not asking, okay? We're into a practical application of the question we were asking about, what if the other person doesn't ask? Okay. Bimale yoma de kipura, amar ihu, izil ana lefiusele. It's Erev Yom Kippur, and Rav says, you know what, he's not coming to me. I'm going to go to him to work this out. Great example of saying on Erev Yom Kippur that this is something we all have responsibility for, for each other. So Rav wants to go work this out. But something shocking happens on the way. Paga be Rav Huna. He bumps into a student, Rav Huna, Amar Leh, and Rav Huna says to him, Lehecha Kazomar, Master, where are you going? Amar Leh, and he says, Lefuse Laplania, to reconcile with such and such. Amar, and Rav Huna says, Azalaba lamiktal nafsha. Uh, you know, you're, you're about to go commit murder. There should be a collective ha in the room. Huh? <laughs> What's he talking about? This is the case where, again, the other person didn't initiate, and apparently this is a case where in the interaction the other person is not ready or prepared to ask for forgiveness. Have you ever had the situation where someone did something wrong to you and then they treated you like you did something wrong to them? So here's what happens. Azo the Kama Ilave, he doesn't listen to Rapuna. Rav goes ahead. Havayate the Kapali Resha. This is pretty graphic, but the symbolism is strong. What's the butcher doing? The butcher's sitting there splitting, splitting skulls of whatever kind of animal he's, uh, he's filleting, okay? It's pretty brutal. You get the sense that this is a very 
Violent might be a word you could use. They talk, you know, that, that, that someone who's born under the sign of Mars channels a violent tendency to being a butcher, something like that. So there's, there's, something, there's something very uh, almost threatening about this. So Rob enters in to reconcile with the guy who's in the middle of kind of splitting heads. He looks up at him in the middle of his work. Dali, in other words, he's, he keeps going, right? He sees Rob as he's doing this bloody work. I'm Marley, Abaat, that's his, his, his proper name. You? That's who's here. You're here? Zeal, get out. Lately, I have nothing to say to you. He's not ready. At that moment, he splits the skull, bone comes out, gets stuck in his throat, butcher dies. Wow, right? That's quite the story. Who killed the butcher? <laughs> Who killed the butcher? Did Ruff kill the butcher? Did Ruff kill the butcher? Rafuna said that Ruff was going to kill the butcher. Did Ruff kill the butcher? Well, I mean, clearly there was an accident here. Ruff didn't make the accident happen. On the other hand, we don't believe that things are purely accident. This is a very strongly symbolic story. It sounds as though God thought it was appropriate for this butcher to be punished at this specific moment. Um, and it sounds as though the way Rav Huna foreshadows it, Rav has some kind of responsibility for this. Now, Rav doesn't really kill the butcher. And the butcher would still be alive if the butcher was supposed to be alive. And yet, idea in terms of forgiveness Sometimes when someone hasn't asked for forgiveness, preemptive forgiveness is appropriate. And sometimes preemptive forgiveness is ducking out of the work we have to do in really dealing with another person. But sometimes it's the right thing to do because the other person in an interaction that seeks reconciliation is just going to make matters worse. Okay, let's finish up. Two more quick stories and we'll come to the end of our evening, okay? Each of these stories has another point to make to us about Shuba. Number one, source number 15. I'm Rabban Gamliel. Rabban Gamliel has just done a series, uh, has had a series of, uh, of debates with Rabbi Yoshua that have culminated him in, in, in his actually being deposed from the position of the Nasi. And he decides that the time has come to make up with him. I'm Rabban Gamliel, is of the Rabbi Yoshua. I'm going to go and I'm finally going to make it up with Rabbi Yoshua. Kimata Labete, Rabban Gamliel gets to Rabbi Yoshua's home. This is on the bottom of page six. Chazinu la'ashita debete de Mishachron. And he sees that the walls of Rabbi Yoshua's home are black or darkened. Why are they black and darkened? He figures it out. Amar lo, Rabban Gamliel says to Rabbi Yoshua, Mikot lebetcha ata nikar shepach mi'ata. From the walls of your home being blackened, I recognize that you must be a blacksmith because you're working with fire and the fumes are going to the wall and they're darkening the wall. Okay, now remember, this is the opening line. They've had a series of conflicts. He's been deposed over his conflict with Rabbi Yoshua. He comes to his home. He's not in the threshold. He comes into his home to seek forgiveness and his opening line is, I guess it sounds like small talk, right? Like harmless small talk. I see from the walls of your home that you must be a blacksmith. And Rabbi Yeshua's response is, Woe is to the generation that you're in charge of them because you have no idea what other Talmidei Chachamim who are not in the elevated house of the Nasi and very, very well off have to go through. You know, I had to make a living. You, we've known each other all these years and you were oblivious. Um, they go on and they have a conversation, and at the end, he gets forgiveness in part because of the honor of his father, not even because Rabbi Yeshua is particularly moved by him. Um, but there's, there's, an, there's an important element here for those of us who, um, who need to forgive and who are seeking forgiveness, and this has to do with, are we recognizing who the other person really is when we're having this conversation. In Rav's case, it was very extreme, right? He really misread what was the butcher was prepared to tolerate, and things became much worse. 
This is a less extreme case, but it's still severe. Okay? Rabban Gamliel is not really aware of who Rabbi Yoshua is, which complicates Rabbi Yoshua's ability to forgive him. And Rabbi Yoshua is looking at Rabban Gamliel and thinking, you are so far removed from me that it is hard for me to forgive you. One of the things apparently that we need to do if we're going to seek forgiveness properly and if we're going to grant forgiveness properly is to think not just about who we are in this situation, but to think to the extent we can about who the other person really is and what their concerns are in the interaction with them. One last point, and then we'll finish up. And it's the last story from Erevin. And the truth is, it's my favorite, because I think it gives, of all the stories we've seen, the best model of what we're trying to do. Rava Bered Rav Yosef Bar Chama, Havle Milted Rav Yosef Bade. Rava and Rav Yosef are in conflict. Apparently, Rava insulted Rav Yosef. Kimata, Male Yoma de Kippuri. Again, it's Erev Yom Kippur. He wants to make it right. Amar Rava says, Isabel Faisay, I'm going to go and I'm going to seek forgiveness. Azal, he goes in. And he sees that the servant of Rav Yosef is in the midst of mixing up a drink for Rav Yosef. Now, mixing a drink for a person used to be a really intimate act. I think the closest thing we have to that today is like when someone really knows exactly how you like your coffee. Right? There's a certain level of intimacy where they don't even have to ask and they know that it's exactly this amount of sugar and this amount of milk and they put it in front of you. Um, so he sees, Rava sees that the servant is making this cup, and it's pr- probably wine for, uh, for Rav Yosef, Amarle, and he says to the servant, I'm going to mix it up for him. This is interesting. We want to contrast it. Think about the difference between standing at the threshold or waltzing right in. Okay? How is Rava entering into the encounter when he's seeking forgiveness? He's starting by putting himself in the footsteps of a servant. Okay, so he says he's going to do it. He's going to mix it up. Yahav lay. Mazge, so the servant gives it to him, he mixes it up. Kidetame amar, when Rav Yosef takes the drink, he says, hmm, dami hai maziga la maziga de Rava bere de Rav Yosef Barhama. This tastes like the kind of drink that Rava used to mix me up. I haven't drunk something quite like this in a long time. We get the sense, by the way, of just how intimate the relationship was previously. How does Rava respond? Amarle says to him, Anahu. Uh, he was blind. That, I'm sorry, I should have filled that in. Why didn't he know he was blind? Um, Rava says, it's me. Yeah, I'm here. Okay? That's the opening line. I want you to contrast the opening line of Rava Namliel with the opening line of Rava. Right? He puts himself in a position of the servant. And he says, I'm here standing before you in this position. Now, what's of interest to us in terms of forgiving others is how do you respond to what is almost an ideal opening move from the person seeking forgiveness? And look at what Rav Yosef says. Amr leh, lo tativa kar'ech adem afarshat li hani kray. Don't sit down. Stay right here. And I want you to interpret for me the following verses. And the verses are not verses I think we would ordinarily associate with tshuva. The verses come from a description of the travels of B'nai Israel in the wilderness. Sounds like a real non sequitur. Rav Yosef says, What do these verses mean, telling us we went from the wilderness? And these can be different names of places even. Amr Le, Rav responds, if a person makes himself like a wilderness, what type of wilderness? That everyone trods in it. He can move from the midbar to matana. The Torah becomes your gift when you're willing to make yourself humble and open like a wilderness. The kevan, I'm sorry, there's a problem here in the Hebrew. The kevan shenitna lo matana, we're in the middle of the line, once it's given to him as a gift, nachlo el, 
It really becomes his lot from God. It's not just a gift, it's God is really making it his lot. God made it his lot, his inheritance. Then he reaches great heights. He goes from getting the inheritance to going to a bama, an elevated place. But if he gets overly proud or haughty, HaKadosh Baruch Hu below. God will lower him down. Shinemar mi bamot hagai. You go from the high place to the valley. Ve'im chozer bo, but if he does tshuva, hakadosh baruch hu magbio. Lifts him up again. Shinemar kol gai nasei. Every low place will be lifted up. Now it's a beautiful exegetical reading of these different place names, right? It's saying they're not just place names. This is a process. This is a process that we experience. If we want to get the Torah, we have to be humble enough to allow the Torah to come to us. And if we are and we're open to it, it becomes ours from God. But there's a danger there that we start to think we own it in a certain way where we're overly proud. And then we will get knocked down, but there's still a possibility for tshuva and the ultimate real rising up that comes from the reconciliation with God in tshuva. Now, we could read this as just the ultimate non sequitur. Uh, but in fact, I think it's an extraordinary act of forgiveness. Rav and Rav Yosef are Tamidei Chachamim. They've learned Torah together. Rav Yosef is older than Rav. He's taught him Torah. Rav is coming to seek forgiveness, and he's done it in a very subtle way with a clear message, right? He put himself in the, ma- in the footsteps of the servant. He made the drink. He said he waited for Rav Yosef to understand he was there, and he said, yeah, I'm here. I'm before you, as it were. I'm in your hands. And Rav Yosef responds with great delicacy. What Rav Yosef does is twofold. Number one, he prompts him. He prompts him to say the message, to, for, to perform a full-fledged act of tshuva that includes really explaining why they should be able to be reconciled. And he prompts him to do this in a sort of code where this code is going back and forth in the manner of what they used to do together. He wants to be reconciled so that they can learn Torah again together. That's part of what the idea is about, that they can be unified in Torah. And he's saying, well, part of what's going to happen is I'm going to ask you to teach Torah to me. There's something exquisitely beautiful about this. It's almost like saying he came in and it's like he's saying, well, play our song. You know, well, I'm here. Okay, play our song. Let's hear it. He's giving him a chance to make an interpretation that says what needs to be said, and he's ready to listen. What sets this act of tshuva apart, and the message, of course, is very resonant. It's like what we saw with Rav Yirmiya and Rav Abba, that one time you're asking for tshuva and one time you're not, but in a different type of way of saying, yes, we cycle up, we cycle down, but there's this possibility. He's hinting here, Rav, yeah, I've been too haughty. I got my comeuppance. And I'd like to rise back up. Um, But what's so significant about this particular story is just how dialogical it is, how much it depends on a real conversation or interaction and subtle cues between two people. It's almost, in some ways, the opposite of preemptive tshuva. This is a moment where the person seeking tshuva is ready to have a genuine encounter but is also allowing the person who gives forgiveness as the one who sets this tone and is the one who decides what that encounter should look like. And the master of forgiveness, Rav Yosef, finds a way to invite discussion with subtlety, with beauty, with Torah, so that they're truly reconciled and united by the time that they're through. And that, of course, is what we should aspire to do as we move toward this Yom Kippur. We should aspire to make forgiveness a fundamental, integral part of who we are, to whatever extent possible, to be the kinds of people who know how to forgive. If we can make a habit before we go to bed of forgiving everybody who might have wronged us, it's a a wonderful thing. Davening for them wouldn't hurt either if we're up to it. At the least, understanding that We have a responsibility to forgive the other person because that other person can't really make things right without us doing that. And we're doing it for them, but we're also doing it for us. 
and understanding that the way, the how that we do it sometimes can be almost important, as important as what we're doing. And we should seek as much as possible for the how to be a measure of dialogue and reconciliation in the hopes that Bezrat Hashem, really, God will see that model and he'll act that way with us. Shana Tova. Thank you so much.